people see that? Yeah. Okay. So most of the time you give a presentation at the end, you wrap it up and you cover the points that you want to cover. I'm going to do just the opposite. I'm going to start at the back end and work forward. So these are the points I'm going to try to make as we go through the presentation. And the most important thing of all are these insurance products. They're not investments. You buy insurance to protect yourself against something bad happen. You buy insurance to move the risk over to somebody else or to at least spread it out. And these are definitely insurance products. They're uh, contracts. Uh, it's not a good place to invest. They're, it's too expensive, but it solves a lot of problems that people have. The next thing are the protections. You can buy protections, part of the insurance portion of it, and they can be very expensive. And I'll go over some of the expenses of some of them. Uh, many of them are extremely complicated. I was handed a, uh, the contract for a, a variable annuity one time and it was an inch long and, and the guy says, oh, wait a minute, I have a supplement to it. It's another half inch. And uh, it's almost impossible to read because it back and forth, it's lawyer talk. When you buy an annuity too, you should look at it as a long-term contract. It's going to be probably at least 20 years, if not a lifetime. Uh, when we buy mutual funds and stocks, you know, we buy them and trade them and move around and change our asset allocation and whatnot. Uh, these things are pretty well fixed and you just have to live with them. You marry them, basically. The last point is there's no bad annuities. They're just bad salesmen. You know, they have a terrible reputation out in the marketplace and it's not the annuities themselves. Most of them are built to solve some, some kind of a problem, but they're just the salesmen sell them deceptively and people get trapped into them. My experience is uh, they're not bought, they're sold to somebody and people are unsuspecting. I've helped five people that had annuities in their portfolio and not one of them knew what they had. So that's, that's kind of the, the way they work. So here's a 20 second history. They've been around since Roman times. The church used them in the 1500s to take a little slice of the profit and support the church. They really kicked in right after the stock market crash in 1929. The, the stock market crash was terrible. Uh, out of the stock market, they'd formed the Social Security Administration Act, and it protected a lot of people. It only covered a certain number of people, only about half of the, of the wage earners. Farmers weren't covered. Uh, independent contractors weren't covered. Government employees weren't covered. Teachers weren't covered. And so the teachers decided they wanted to have some kind of supplemental retirement plan, and uh, Tia Kress stepped in and offered them a TSA, a tax sheltered annuity. And um, it, it, it changed the, uh, the marketplace considerably. 1958, they signed a new IRS law. It was called 403B, but nobody called it that. They called it TSAs because that's the only thing it was can be sold in. It was tax sheltered annuities. And it allowed the salesmen to come into the teacher's break rooms and uh, every Tuesday or whatever it is and bring muffins and coffee and sell these things to the unsuspecting teachers. Well, all that changed in 1974. ERISA was passed, changed the retirement rules and it allowed mutual funds to come into the, uh, the 403Bs and they started calling them 403Bs. So that's kind of the development. Uh, they've been accepted ever since because of the teachers. Unfortunately, the teachers are still allowing the salesmen to come into their break room. Over half the teachers still have tax sheltered annuities in their 403Bs, which I think they could do extremely better than doing that. And I've helped a couple of them get out of those things. Okay, so here's, it's a huge industry, $2 trillion are in effect. Uh, 2019 set a record, $240 billion. 2020, uh, there's been a decrease in sales because of the pandemic. It's because the salesmen are not able to get to the clients themselves. Uh, I'm sure in 2021, it'll set a new record. Most of the sales are in variable annuities and index annuities. So before I go too much, I have to say something about the fiduciary rule. The Obama administration in 2013 decided that they were going to come out with a fiduciary rule and busloads of lawyers and lobbyists end up going to the politicians and did everything they could to defeat it. Uh, but the sales went down for a few years because of the fiduciary rule. And uh, when the Trump administration came in, they were able to quelch it. And it's back to kind of a best interest, uh, kind of a suitability uh, thing. So they watered it down considerably. And uh, it's not as effective uh, as it could be, although they have some of them running. Uh, two years ago, they went to the annuity companies and they said, we want you to come forward. If you've been selling annuities that had 12B1 fees in them and whatnot, we want you to turn yourselves in. 100, 
100 companies turn themselves in, but not everybody. And I'll have an example of somebody who didn't a, a little bit later. This is what the market looks like. Um, the, I'll point out the orange. Orange are fixed annuities. Those are probably the most useful. I've re actually recommended those before, but they, they sell about 10% of the market every year. Michael Keitze, I call him Kites, uh, says they, they don't sell very well because there's not much of a commission in those. And so they stay about the same all the time. You can see the bottom, the green are uh, index annuities. They're rising constantly. And of course, the blue is, uh, is the variable annuities. You can see at the top of the graph, 2013, that kind of leveled off for a few years. That's when they were trying to deal with this fiduciary rule and the sales dropped off uh, considerably. This just shows the index annuity sales. You can see the growth has happened over the last 10 years or so. So these are, can you see my, can you see my mouse? I can't see it, tell me you see it or not. But anyway, on the left-hand side, you'll see the mouse is pointing at Bright House. It's number 13 and number, and uh, 17 is River Source. So Bright House sells a, a lot of products. They sell mostly uh, variable annuities. And uh, this, you can come back later and look at this, uh, just see where the companies that are selling these things. Probably a better place to go is J.D. Powers to look at the people who are satisfied with the annuities they have. You'll notice River Source is at the very top, Bright House is at the very bottom. So if I was going to go out and buy annuity or recommend it to somebody, I'd probably start at those in that end of the scale to help people. So how are they constructed? Uh, they have armies and armies of actuaries. It's probably one of the easiest uh, degrees to get a job on. Starting pay is over $100,000. And if you have a degree, you get hired. Uh, insurance company buys them by the bus loads. And they use large data pools and calculate uh, things that are going to happen in the future. And the way they're developed, it'll be A plus B plus C plus D. They build in a profit margin and then they decide what the cost is going to be. They, the marketing department comes in and says, hey, the customer doesn't like this. He, he wants 6% instead of 5.5%. Actuaries go in the back room, come back a little bit later. It's no problem. Here's a 6% one. And what they've done is just min, manipulated some of the levers that are on the back end of it because there's a lot of moving parts to uh, some of these. Uh, also, besides the, the regular contract, there's also riders that can be purchased. And if we get a chance, I'll go ahead over a few of the writers are here. I spent just 30 minutes just on one writer at the Bogled thing, just, but uh, we don't have time to do this now. The way they're regulated, if there's no securities involved, for example, income annuities, SPIAs, deferred annuities, and the rest of those, they're regulated on a state level. The state insurance commissioner uh, will regulate and give people licenses to, uh, to uh, sell these things. Uh, it varies state to state. For example, in Florida, um, you go to the Florida State Commissioner website and they'll actually sign you up for the classes. They control the classes. It's 60 hours of online classes and then you take a test. California is a little bit looser. It's like 24 hours uh, studying on your own. And I, did, I calculated how long it would take to get a license for one of these. You could probably do it in two weeks if you can get all the timing right. So you could have a license to sell a fixed index annuity in about two weeks. Uh, as if there's securities involved, like variable annuities, then it's regulated by the SEC and FINRA, and you're going to have to have a Series 7, Series 65, so it's a little more complicated. Most of the variable annuities are sold by stockbrokers and the CFPs. There is some protections in case the insurance company defaults. There's a state guarantee association. It's like having a master insurance policy. All the, all the insurance companies deposit a little bit to it. Uh, it varies state to state. Texas, it'll cover the first 100,000. New York, first 500,000. California will cover the first 80% of the first 250,000, which is kind of weird. And it's determined by the state that you're actually living in. Um, yeah, and they're, uh, the insurance companies are probably not going to go broke because in, annuities have such a bad name. I think uh, most of the time, an insurance company will come in, buy the assets, and, and continue because they don't want to ruin the reputation in, in all reality. It's one of the four things that provides asset protection against bankruptcy and litigation. Uh, one of them is retirement plans like IRA, IRAs, 401ks. Uh, it depends on what the state regulation. Uh, homestead exemption, depending on the state, cash value of life insurance, and cash value and payouts of annuities are protected against litigation. Most famous case is probably O.J. Simpson. He, he uh, uh, charged with murder. He was acquitted. 
uh, after that Goldman sued him as, as a civil case and won and couldn't get any of the money because it was tied up in annuity. So the lawyers did a good job. So uh, a lot of high risk people will buy these for that reason. A surgeon, cosmetic surgeons, uh, anesthesiologists or people that are worried about getting sued, they'll take a little bit of their money and put them in annuities just for the protection that they provide. Commissions, how much the guy make on the other side of the desk when they're selling these things. The uh, lowest commission is income annuities, SPIAs. Uh, it goes anywhere from 500 bucks up to one to 3% is pretty typical. Uh, the, you don't make a lot of money selling them and that's probably one of the reasons more of them aren't sold. I think they're very, very simple. And when I go through the annuities, this is the order I'm gonna go because they become more complex as you go down the list. Deferred fixed annuities, it's usually two to 4% because you're tying up the money, you have to convince a person to give up the money for a period of time. Deferred variable annuities, uh, usually sold by stockbrokers, it, it can be a real money maker for them. Typically it's around 7% with a 1% tail. And, and the way it works is um, the commission is directly associated with the surrender fee. So when you buy a variable annuity, there's an accumulation um, period and then a payout period. During the accumulation period, there'll be a surrender period. Typically it's about seven years and it starts at 7%. Each year it'll decrease 1%. So it'll go 7%, 6%, 5%, 4%, but you also get a 1% tail. So every year you, you'll get a 1% kickback. So if you get $100,000 annuity to somebody, uh, you get 7,000 bucks to put in your pocket and then you get 1,000 bucks for the next uh, seven years. So when they talk about it's a good, good for your retirement plan, he's probably talking about his own retirement plan, not necessarily your retirement plan. Fixed index annuities, these are the most complicated of all, the most difficult to sell. The commissions usually run about six to 8%. Remember the threshold for selling these things is very small. Uh, you, you know, you could have a, a license within a, a couple of weeks or a month. These are usually the chicken dinner annuities that you hear about. And uh, if I get a chance, I'll talk more about, about those because it's a whole industry. All those decrease a little bit, it's a whole industry. Uh, you can also do 1035 exchanges. The SPIAs, infra, income annuities and QLACs, I'll explain those a little bit later, are not transferable because that's a contract that you signed. But the variable annuities, fixed index annuities, and the, the thing is they are transferable because they're still moving parts during the accumulation phase. Uh, often when you transfer it from one to another, it starts a new surrender period and, you'll, and they'll often get a commission. Uh, technically, the new annuity must be better when you fill out the form to move it from one to the other. You're supposed to match the features of each one and it's supposed to be better, but it's a pretty low threshold and it's done all the time. Uh, I've helped two people that had annuities and I talk to them and, and figure out what they have and they go back and tell their advisor and twice I've had an advisor uh, take them out of one annuity and put them into another and locked them in for a new surrender period. So. That happens uh, more than you want to uh, know about. So if you help somebody that has an annuity, tell them to tell their advisor not to do anything until you've come up with a conclusion with what you want to, what you want to do. Uh, the, they're not always accepted at the new company. I helped a lady, 84 year old, that had been sold an annuity, and I, I got a hold of her account, moved it all over to Vanguard, except for an, a variable annuity. I called Vanguard up; they sent me the annuity department, and I said, "I have an annuity. I want to do a 1035 in it." And I read it to him, and he says, "You know, that's such a bad annuity. We don't even take it." So a lot of times, they won't even accept the new annuity. In this case, I waited until the anniversary period and just took the surrender period and, and moved it into a real investment. Taxation, this is a big part of this. And um, if it comes in a qualified account, like an IRA 403B, of course, it's all gonna be taxable when you get a payment. If it's just regular taxable account, you buy them, uh, it, there's gonna be a calculation that takes place. It's called an exclusion percentage. Uh, you can go to IRS pub 939. It's a fairly simple calculation. TurboTax handles it real well. And uh, when I, I used to do taxes for senior citizens, every once in a while they come in with a 1099R and it wouldn't be calculated, but they showed us how to do the calculations. It depends on what type of an, uh, the payout you're gonna get on it. And those are listed down there at the bottom. 
the portion is going to be taxable as earnings. It'll always be taxable. You cannot escape the tax. There is no way to get out of the taxation, the earnings that take place inside of it. Uh, if it's inherited, they'll have to pay the earnings. So you can imagine if you put a beneficiary of your kids and you end up dying and there's, there's a hundred thousand dollars left in an annuity, they're going to get a hundred thousand dollar tax bomb. So uh, it's probably not, not a place to leave a legacy to your kids. There's also going to be a portion that's non-taxable. And what that is, is the return of a uh, principal. So when you get your 1099 R block one will be total amount and then block two is the taxable amount. And the difference between those two is the return of principal. Usually it's calculated to your life expectancy to return all of your principal. And so at life expectancy, it'll all be taxable. And I've had ladies come in, 85 year old ladies come in and say, oh, they've made a mistake. You know, it used to be partially taxable and this year it's all taxable. And I have to explain to her that, you know, she's lived past the life expectancy when she purchased it. So that's the, that's the situation. So where do you buy these things? SPIAs, income annuities, are probably the least complicated. You can go to immediateannuities.com and just put your stuff in there. After this, you can just type your information in there. It'll tell you what you're going to get. You can say I'm 65 or 70 or 80 or whatever it is. It'll bring up several companies, and then you can go over to the companies and buy the annuity right from there. There's several other sites besides that. Uh, I used to send people over to Vanguard and Fidelity and to Schwab. They had some no commission of SPIAs that they would sell you. But uh, of course, as you know, Vanguard is out of the business now. They don't deal with annuities. Three years ago, when Mike and I did the annuities presentation, we uh, part of the Boglehead conference is to go over to Vanguard. And uh, Tim Buckley was a CEO and he went on stage and took written comments and so I uh, written questions. So I wrote a question that said, if Vanguard is all about simplicity and low cost, what are they doing selling variable annuities, which are complicated and high cost? And he thought for a minute and he said, you know, we just use it as a, as a, a backup position. We really don't market them and, and push them. And it was about eight months later, he made an announcement that Vanguard was going to get out of the annuity business. So now if you go to the ribbon at the top and click on investments and drop down as annuities, you click on that and it basically says, we don't do this anymore. So the variable annuities are a little bit more complicated and a lot of more moving parts. I'd probably send somebody to Fidelity and Schwab. They are complicated. It's going to take a while. If you have a trusted agent that wants to sit with you and explain all the details, it might work. Um, I, I'll address that in a little bit later, but they're very complicated and there's lots of moving parts and you need to have an education to do that, to find somebody that'll go through. If you're going to do it on your own, I'd probably look at at least four or five different annuities that, that they say are comparable, just so you can get, uh, educate yourself how they work and I'll, hopefully I'll get a chance to explain it. So sales of them are, are uh, high pressure often and, and they're good. The salesmen are really good at what they do. I've interacted with two of them before. And uh, I mean, they're professional. They do it day in and day out. You do it once in a lifetime and they're good. It's like buying a car. You know, a guy sells four or five cars a day. You go once every 10 years and buy a car. He knows what he's doing. You're, you're on the uh, defense. So how do they sold? This is typical. Uh, this is usually a 45 minute or a 50 minute pitch. I'm going to give it in about 30 seconds here. But the first thing you do is you scare them. You say, you know, the stock market is bad. This pandemic thing is going to make it worse. People are going to end up losing their money. There's going to be a lot of people living in boxes on the street. They're going to be eating dog food, and you, you may be one of them. Imagine if, you're, if your kids found out that you've lost all, all your money and your investments, and you're having to live out on the street, or even your neighbors. That's two. Number three is, so I've been looking at your portfolio, and I see this is really unique. It don't come across this very often, but I think I have something that can that can help you. It has a participation rate of 55%. It has a roll up of six and a half percent with a payout of 2%. And then you get some graphs and you show them the graphs and then you wait. I mean, that's part of the pitch and you wait. And what you're waiting for is for the client to say, well, what do you think I should do? Once you say that the game is over, you are now owned by the salesman. He's going to direct you where he wants to direct you. And, uh, and, and he's probably going to convince you from there because like I said, they're very good at what they do. Some of the things that you set off your BS monitor, if you're listening to these people, if they start talking about 8% guaranteed compounded growth, 
you should stop the conversation right there and dig into that and make him explain exactly what he means by that because it is possible, but there's some real big uh, uh, what ifs about it. Uh, if he starts talking about an upfront bonus, that's another BS uh, flag that should come up. If he talks about market upside, no downside, they talk about this all the time when they're selling fixed index annuities. That you, you should stop the game right there and, um, and make sure you understand it. And if it's too good to be true, like anything, you should stop and start questioning it. Uh, in California, you get a 30-day free look. It's different state to state, but usually what happens, you sign the contract, the clock starts, you don't hear anything, and you think you've made such a good decision, it'll be you know, a month later, two months later, you'll get contacted again by the insurance salesman. But there's, there's a 30-day free look that you can say, I don't want to do this anymore. So this is the way they're sold, the roulette. So this is, the next part is to kind of explain some of the annuities. So I was going to stop here, take a sip of water, and see if Chris or Greg has anything that they want to, want to any questions that are real pressing. Otherwise, I'll move on and do the annuities themselves. Okay, well, we have a couple questions uh, people wrote. I'll just... I'll just ask the one from Jean right now. She asks, are commission on these products paid to the agent yearly and for how long? Maybe you already addressed that or maybe not completely. Yeah, you, that's a good question. Usually it's a one-time payment and premiums. You know, you don't have to keep paying year after year after year because it's taken out of the front end. And so uh, if you sell $100,000, you're going to get a, a $7,000 $7, commission that goes right into your bank account. And it's protected, your commission is protected by the surrender fee that takes place. The only exception to that is variable annuities will have a tail. And that tail will normally last for the, the length of the surrender period. You know, typically it's seven, per, seven years. I've seen a variable annuity that has a 14-year a surrender period and a 10% surrender fee. And the way it worked was the first year is 10%, 10%, 10%, then it went 9%, 9%, 8%, and that went down the steps. But uh, usually you'll get a, a commission right up front, and then you get a tail on the variable annuities. Okay, great. Uh, I got another question. I believe this is from Deb. She's, it's DK on here. But um, she asks, if a person is close to retirement and has a decent pension, and a good portion of money into the market, is it wise to get an annuity for protection against market instability? Yeah, well, I'll talk about, I'll talk about one of the annuities uh, that'll take some fear out of your investing life. But if you have enough money, uh, I see no reason to, to tie it up into annuity. If you're even gonna buy it for a, an investment, there's probably a better way to solve that problem. But if you have enough cash flow, what you're basically buying the annuities for is the protection against uh, running out of money. Uh, you're buying protection against your account balance going below zero, or you're buying protection that in the future, you're going to produce cash flow. Those are the normal things that you'll buy it for. So if you don't have those needs, like you're a fear of running out of money, then there, I see no reason to buy an annuity. Okay, great. Last question on here. If you are still taking questions, um, yeah, one more. One more. We need. I guess okay. Some. What is the size of most annuities from Angus? Oh, it varies. Anything. I mean, you can you can buy a ten thousand dollar annuity, and you can buy a two hundred thousand dollar annuity. One of the selling points of annuities is there's no limits. You can you can sink as much money as you want into them. So that's one of the selling points. But yeah, you can you can probably buy one. $10,000. And I'll show you one annuity here. I think it's $2,500, the multi-year guaranteed annuity. It's a, it's a small amount. So, okay. So let's, let's go over some of the annuities, how they work, how's the uh, functions. And they're, I'll say it again, they are very complicated. Uh, all of them are different. Every company writes them a little bit different, but I'll try to give you enough information that you'll recognize what they are and you'll kind of recognize what the good points and the bad points of, of them are. So this is the way they're broken down for us humans. It's easier to classify things. On the left side is an immediate annuity. Immediate means you're going to receive payments in less than a year. 
out of that, you can get a fixed annuity, which is a fixed amount. People are familiar with that. You can actually give a chunk of money and get receive variable payments. Very small amount of people of the market does it. It's like two tenths of a percent. So I'm not even gonna address the immediate variable annuities. On the deferred side is um, fixed annuities where you give a chunk of money and you wait and then you annuitize it or variable annuities where you have an accumulation and you have an account where it's supposedly supposed to build up a greater amount and then you annuitize it. So we'll start out with the immediate fixed annuities. Like I said, these are the most practical. Uh, I've recommended these to people before, especially people worried about running out of money. You give them a chunk of money, $100,000, let's say, and uh, and they you sign a contract and they, you, they start receiving payments. Um, the way you receive the payments, you, you should probably school yourself a little bit in the way you receive them. There's usually three different ways to receive them. One is a lifetime annuity where you turn over the money and uh, you get it for the life of that person. So the danger is you give it to the for that person and two weeks later they die. Oh, that's a done deal. I mean, the, that money is gone. Uh, the next one is a joint annuity where usually it's a spouse. Uh, one person dies and the other person, it keeps paying out. Those are joint annuities. And there's tons of ways that those are paid out. Sometimes they'll pay out 50%, 70%, 90%. It, it's all over the all over the map, but it's a joint annuity. And your insurance agent should know what he's doing when he, when he signs you up for the joint. If you put on there, it's to Mary and Joseph, and the beneficiary is the son, if it's written as if it's Mary and Joseph and one of them die, it triggers going to the beneficiary. So you should always make sure the spouse is put in the beneficiary, period. That mistake is, often happens. And the last one is called period certain, uh, a real popular one. I'll show you a graph in a second about the payouts of those. And usually a period certain is like for 10 years. So if you die, no matter what, they're going to continue paying out uh, payments for at least 10 years on it. Uh, it's real popular because people don't want to have the thought of dying and losing everything. So they'll, they'll revert to kind of the middle ground, which is a 10 year payout. And you can have 15 year payout, 20 year payouts or whatever but it's a real real popular way to do it. So when you go in and talk to the insurance agent or sign the contract, you should kind of be prepared on how you exactly you want it done and the person who sells you should help you. So some of the advantages of it, it it's a known quality. It, it simplifies things. It protects against returns. You don't have to know about asset allocation and bonds and stocks and all that complicated stuff. And it, and it, out, uh, it, it solves outlasting your assets. One thing it doesn't solve though, if you have a, a, this called a spending shock, something all of a sudden you need a ton of money, uh, it doesn't protect against that because sometimes you'll have too much money tied up in, a, in an annuity. Um, the payout's gonna be larger in a stock and bond portfolio. Let's say standard withdrawal rate of 4%. Same case scenario, you're gonna get more than this. You're probably gonna get, I don't know, let's say 6% or 6.5% is gonna be the payout. And the reason is those people die before their life expectancy and that pool of money goes back into the pool and helps pay the people that are still living. And it's called mortality credits. Some of them even have places that you can do a one-time partial withdrawal in the middle in case you do have a, a, a spending shock. Uh, it costs you. I mean, everything's built into costs. Uh, one, another thing, it avoids probate. It's, you know, it, it avoids that like a life insurance policy or your IRA. Some of the disadvantages, it's not your money anymore. It's not your money, it's their money. They have the money. Once you sign it over and you sign the contract, it is their money. So you should take that out of your, your asset pool. Inflation protection. People say, well, I'll just buy an immediate annuity and buy some inflation protection. Well, it used to be, uh, only four or five companies had a real COLA where they would take the uh, consumer price index, whatever it happens to be, WE or whatever it happens to be, and you, they get to adjust the payout according to the consumer price index. Those are gone. Uh, the last one was principal and it stopped in 2019, but they do have COLAs. They're called a step-up COLA where you can pay some money and they'll guarantee to increase your payout 
two percent, three percent, one percent, whatever you want to want to do. Very few people take the cola once they see what the what the haircut is that you take on them. The haircut is about twenty eight percent, huge. Only about four percent of the people take the cola once they once they see what it what it takes. A big danger that you see you get locked into a payment and inflation runs away. I still remember 1980 that I went back and looked at the highest year. It was 13.5% inflation. Uh, these don't have any hedge against inflation. I remember seeing banners on, on uh, banks for 12% CDs. And uh, I had a 12% mortgage one time. I bought a house in Torrance. And uh, so inflation can really erode uh, the value of these things. So you have to be careful. Uh, you lose if you, if you die before life expectancy. And um, a lot of the taxation is going to be ordinary income. So they're not very uh, tax efficient. And I already mentioned at the end of the exclusion period, your life expectancy, it's going to be all ordinary income. So why would you buy one? Most, most often you're afraid of depleting assets, but it does simplify your investing. It gives peace of mind. I'll tell you, second Wednesday when I get that Social Security deposit in my checking account, it's a it's party time around my house. It's nice to have a, a guaranteed deposit into your account. And they're pretty easy to shop for. Some things you consider, never to annuitize your entire investment assets. I ran into a, a, a dentist who did that. Every penny he had, he had in annuities. And I asked him, what if something happens? You know, he said, well, I have insurance and, you know, so, but it's probably not a good idea because you locked out growth that can take place. You can consider staggering. Let's say you've only got $300,000 yet left uh, at 70. You can take out, uh, let's say you know, $25,000 at 70, wait until 75, take out another $25,000, 80, take out another 25. And each year you wait, it's going to be a little bit larger payout. Uh, you lose the legacy part. So if you have kids that are looking for money, uh, they'll probably be unhappy about, about it. Um, Social Security. Social Security is probably the best annuity that is out there. I, I can't say that enough. I, I don't know how to say it. it you know, it's, it's portable. You know, as you move from employer to employer, it follows you around no matter what. It's backed up by the United States government. Uh, it's not by some insurance company. Uh, you get a cost of living adjustment. That's, uh, that matches inflation, it's pretty good. And the last thing is 15% uh, of it is gonna be tax-free. At least 15% is gonna be tax-free. So it's, it's the best uh, annuity that you can get out of there. But before you start investing in a lot of these annuities, you should probably delay your social security as long as you can. So here's a payout. This is a 10 year certain payout. The black line is the Moody's AAA uh, corporate bond yield. It's called the seasonal seasonal bond yield. You can see it's fluctuated around. The green line on top is the payout for a 65-year-old male. You can see it used to be like $650 and you can, and the, the, uh, the red is a female. The male gets more because we die earlier. You know, the women live longer, so they're going to get less. It has to be actuarially, actuarially correct. But you can see the trend. If you look at 2018, 2019, 2020, and you can see what happens to the payouts. They basically follow the trend of the seasonal bond yield. I checked last night, the yield was 2.38%. 2 and I guarantee that those payouts are gonna go back down. So the question is, do I try to time the market? Do I try to wait until, the, until bond yields are up and then buy the annuity? Well, it's tough time in anything. I mean, you just can't do it. And behaviorally, it's difficult. Usually when the yields are up, CDs are paying a lot and you feel good, stock market is up, things are, things are going good. It's only when things are down that you start looking at these annuities and usually the yield will be down. So my opinion is if you need it, just go buy it when, it, when you need it. So, so let's go on the other side to a deferred fixed. Deferred fixed is just like a Single premium, there's two, two of them that I'll talk about. The multi-year guaranteed annuity is hot right now. And people are talking about it on the forum I see. And I'll, I won't say too much about it, but I'll tell you what they are. But the longevity annuity is something different. So let's talk about the multi-year guaranteed annuity. Basically what it is, it's a CD with a huge surrender charge. So instead of, let's say you buy a CD 
and they charge you, if you pull your money out, you get penalized three months of interest, 75 bucks or so. If you pull the money out of the equivalent of multi-year guarantee annuity, it's gonna cost you a thousand bucks to get out of it. So big difference, $75, $1,000. The money is tax deferred. You should probably stay with CDs until re, uh, while you're still working until at least 59 and a half. And then if you want it, you can go over to these uh, multi-year guaranteed annuities. Uh, the interest compounds, unlike CDs, CDs you have to pay the tax on the year that it's received. These, these you can keep rolling them over, rolling them over. You can do 1035s over and over and over until some time in the future. They're not guaranteed, uh, FDIC insured. And uh, even if you die, the beneficiary of it has to pay the surrender charge. Uh, usually you should stay with CDs up to one or, two per, uh, one or two years out. You can start looking at these things at three years. The sweet spot is probably about five years. And the payout I showed is, is 3%, 3.5%, but you're locked into these things. I don't know if you can see that. I won't spend too much time on it. This is from Immediate Annuities. They have a button there. Just click on it. It'll show you what the payouts are, how much you have to put into it. There's some $2,500. And the highest one is 3.35%. This is three weeks ago. I pulled this out. But uh, they're easy to do it. You click on the quote. It'll take you over to the insurance company, and you just buy it. You write a check, and now you have one of these things. Deferred fixed annuities. It's kind of like an immediate annuity, except you give them the money and you have to wait a while. By waiting, they'll give you a higher rate of return. They'll, they'll guarantee some, some, um, some payouts that are larger because you're tying up the money. Um, sometimes in the middle of it, they'll give you bonuses. Sometimes in the front end, they'll give you bonuses. They'll try to entice you to add a little bit more. You know, if you put $10,000, we'll guarantee you 8%. Uh, sometimes they'll only guarantee the payout for three years or four years uh, at the beginning of it because they don't know what's going to happen to interest rates either. Um, you can take 10% out penalty free if you, as long as you do it before uh, 59 and a half. So it's a way to just defer your taxes basically at some time. So who would buy one of these things? The first thing that comes to mind is somebody who wins a lottery. Most of them go bankrupt in five years. Guy gets a ton of money and uh, I would probably advise him, you know, let's take this and put this for the future so you have a source of income so you don't run out of money in the, in the future. Uh, considerations for a smaller amount of premium, you'll get a larger amount of coverage later on or a larger amount of payoff. Uh, most have a guaranteed death benefit. So if you die, somebody's gonna be able to get the amount, the exact amount that you put into it. You put a hundred thousand bucks, they'll get a hundred thousand bucks. The best example of this is social security. Month by month, you make little payments into it, little payments until you decide when you want to annuitize it. You call insurance, you call a Social Security up and say, okay, I'm ready for the payouts. You know, you can start at 62 or you can wait until 70. It gets better the longer you wait, exactly the same way the, these things work. So I, I need to throw this in just because it's part of an annuity. It's called the Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. They came out in 2014. Um, you can take 25% of your uh, individual retirement account up to $135 and annuitize it, but you have to take payments out by at least age 85. So uh, I'm not a big fan of these. Huey pointed out, in fact, our last meeting, it's only $135,000. That's, that's not a whole lot of money. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a tax bomb. So you hit 85 and now you have to take all this money out and you're gonna get hit with a huge tax bomb. So I'm not a big fan of these things, but, but they're out there. The last one is deferred variable annuity. This is where the money's made. These are the complicated things. It came out in 1950, they're deferred, uh, tax deferred mutual funds and they're wrapped up in insurance policy. Before you buy any of these things, you should be maxing out every other tax advantaged account you got. You, you should be putting money into your 401k. You can put $19,500 into that. You should be putting $6,000 into your IRA before you start funding a, a deferred annuity. Unfortunately, that's not what a lot of people do. The contracts are complex. They have hundreds and hundreds of pages. Most people don't have a clue what they've even bought. Uh, and most of them are sold and they're not bought. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. I've never talked to anybody who's owned a variable annuity that could tell me what they even had. 
there's high high ongoing internal expenses but the good news is you can put as much money as you want into it so the internal expenses well i think i'll show you that in a second so there's two phases to it there's the accumulation phase and then there's a distribution phase the distribution phase is basically you're going to turn it into a single premium income annuity that's the way to look at it the accumulation phase is when all the monkey business takes place so let me see if i've got so the accumulation phase, you take your money and you put it in a mutual fund, except they're called sub-accounts. And it has to be ones that the company, the insurance company offers to you. The value of your account rises and falls with the uh, rate of returns that are in your sub-accounts that are there. So you can lose money. If you put money into one of these things and the stock market or your assets tank, you'll, you'll be underwater. You'll, get, you'll have less money than you, than you started with. The sub-accounts are often subpar. The, the uh, expense ratios used to be 1.5. I think Vanguard's driven them down. They're about 0.97% average now. There's a lot of activity that goes on, trading. There's a lot of mutual funds you've never heard of. Uh, a lot of them have 12B1 fees, which I think ought to be against the law. And some of them even have front-end loads. The SEC site uh, tells about ones that have a 4% front-end load. On these things so it's not a good investment that's the bottom line of the whole thing there's many of fees associated with them there's going to be administrative fees either a flat fee or a percentage there's a mortality and expense risk fee there it's going to detract about 1.25 percent from your assets that are in there you have to deal with a surrender fee you can't touch it for quite a few years uh, usually seven or eight years and uh, like i said i've seen uh, one that had a 14-year surrender period that was 10% penalty. And the government, if you go to the SEC site, uh, they reference one that had a 20% surrender fee. Um, you can buy writers for these to move stuff around, or uh, you go to the salesman and you say, you know, I really don't like this, and what about this? He's got an answer for everything with, uh, with writers. Uh, we'll talk about writers in a second. The accumulation fees, basically you're buying protection and it's not really a good investment. You're buying protection for uh, your account not going below zero or you're buying protection that at a certain time you're going to be able to get a certain percentage payout of it. Uh, Morningstar says that the average expense internally is about 2.4%. At one time, it, when I first started reading it, it was over 3%, so it's coming down. But um, it's not uncommon to see them over 3%. Um, on the Vanguard site, they used to say that you have to hold this for a minimum of 10 years to be able to recover the internal costs to make it any sense at all. If you go on the internet and you start typing these things in and find fraud, you'll end up with, with the lawyers who sue the salesmen, and they're convinced it takes 20 percent, uh, 20 years to be able to recover the cost. So these are long-term things, and they're not a good investment. It's, uh, it's protection that you're buying. Usually you can take out 10% and when you take it out, they always pay out the earnings first, which means it's all taxable. So, so this is an article, I'm, I'm asking Greg to stick, put this on there, you can't read this, but this was just July 29th, AIG, uh, they had a unit of AIG called Valley. They were taking advantage of teachers down in Florida and they were selling them bad variable annuities. They were charging them 2.3% plus here, selling 12B1 fees and it cost them about $20 million to get out of the, get out of the doing wrong. AIG was one of the companies that didn't turn themselves in for, for having bad products. It cost them 20 million bucks for taking advantage of the teachers. It cost them another 20 million bucks because they were using 12B1 fees. So this is a paragraph that just talks about 2.3% of the assets they were having to pay, plus the plate of management fee on the top of that. So. Here's very into, I'm not going to talk about this, but here's a variable annuity exam. I mean, basically, you can give 100000 bucks. You start reading about it. Your friends tell you about it. You say, I'm going to take some money out. You take out $50,000 in the second year, and basically, you're going to be handed $41,000. Now, you're going to lose $9,000 in one year by taking your money out of it. Huge penalties in the beginning of it, and you can read through that later if, uh, if you have an interest. Here's a quote by Jane Bryant Quinn that kind of says it all. He says, you don't date an annuity, you marry it. An annuity isn't a mutual fund that you can buy today and sell tomorrow, nor is it a certificate of deposit. 
ready for any use of maturity. When you buy an annuity, you're making and ought to be making a 15 or 20 year commitment at least. And she's 100% right. These are long term commitments. And like I said, they can go down. Okay, writers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on writers. I, I sent Greg another thing he can post that <coughs> explains every one of these writers. And uh, so minimum accumulation guarantees a minimum of balance at a certain time, minimum withdrawal benefit. It's called a cash refund rider. Uh, you can withdraw at least the amount that you put into it. Uh, the next one, income benefit, is a real popular one. They're pushed a lot by the salesman. It just it guarantees a minimum growth rate, usually of five or seven percent, uh, and they force you to annuitize at a certain period of time. Guaranteed life while withdrawal benefits. Uh, they let you take out a little bit as you go along the way because that makes people feel good. Uh, every one of these annuities are not revenue neutral. It's a, it's a money maker for the insurance company. If it was revenue neutral, they give it to you for free. So it's going to cost you. It's one of those levers they're going to move that's going to detract from what your, what your account balance is going to be. And they have long-term care protection. Protection, you can buy a long-term care policy through an annuity and it's simplified issue, which means they do it over the phone. You don't have to go take a physical. You don't have to do anything. They can just ask you some questions and it's, it's done. Standalone benefits, death benefits for beneficiaries, disability, nursing home, confinement, uh, they can guarantee those. The problem is once you buy an annuity, you can't take it off. You're going to be paying for that annuity for ever, for the life of it. Um, income writer. This, this is what I spent 30 minutes kind of explaining the bogleheads. Be careful. This is where they offer you a 8% compounded rate for 10 years or so. There's two parts of it. One is the roll-up rate, step-up rate, they call it. But the, what, you really, what you really want to know is what the payout rate comparison that is. Because the example at the bottom, if you have an 8% compound rate with only a 4% payout rate, it's $6,600. If you have a 5% compound rate, which sounds a lot different, but you have a 5.5% payout rate, it comes out you make $7,000. So when they start talking about this guaranteed compounding rate, you should be real careful. You should probably look at four or five different policies to see how the payout and the compounding rate uh, compares. So the variable annuity should be bought because you, in the future, sometime you want to turn it into a, a stream of cash flow. You can see that that's not taking place. 90% of the eligible variable annuities are never annuitized. The stockbrokers who are selling these things are selling them as an investment that goes on forever. They never annuitize the thing. So but they've been better off just putting them in as stocks and bonds if they don't annuitize them. So that's the that's from Limer. The year before that, it was over 90% never annuitized them. If you're going to hold on something for 20 years, you'd probably do better just having stocks and bonds. Uh, now there is, before I do the fixed index annuity, there is a case you might want to, you know, that I would consider recommend a, a variable annuity to somebody. First, you have to hold it 20 years. So you want to give it to somebody who's young. So that you're talking 45 years old or so, it's 20 years, they turn 65. You want to make sure that they've already loaded up their 401ks, 195 in their, in their um, IRAs, another 6,000 bucks. You have to guarantee that they're never going to have to need that money again. And I've just never met anybody 45 year old that's been in that condition. Most of the time you're hustling, you're trying to make uh, ends meet and whatnot. But I mean, there is a, there is a room for it. Okay. The last one real quickly is fixed index annuities came out in 1995, big lawsuits because it, when it came out, it had equity index annuities and they, they made it like you own some equities, like there was stock in it. There's no equities involved. Out of the lawsuit, they finally changed the name to fixed index annuities. These are the free dinner annuities. These are, these are the ones that uh, sold by people that just got their, got their license. That, uh, and they're good at it. I mean, I'm telling you. So if, if you're selling these things, just imagine if you can get 20 people into a restaurant and there's companies will set this whole thing up for you. They'll, they'll get the mailing list. They'll send it out. They'll contact. Uh, they'll screen the people to make sure they have liquid assets that you can get your hands on. And, um, you know, so you get 20 people, 100 bucks, uh, you've put out $2,000, 
and another thousand dollars for the company to set the whole thing up. You've got three thousand dollars invested in it. If you sell one annuity at hundred thousand dollars, you made money. So the question is, why do they do it? Because there's money to be made into it. Uh, I could go. I could go on and on. They just had a ruling just like three weeks ago. The uh, the people sell these things says, you know, we're limited. It's called a uh, FINRA 3220 rule that they can only give you up to $100, $100 of free uh, benefit, you know, so the dinner has to be less than 100 bucks. So the salesman wanted to know, what if we do it on Zoom? Can we send them a free dinner because it kind of obligates them? And the FINRA came out and said, you bet, there's no limits. So you can get a lobster dinner and a bottle of wine and, you know, you could, they can send you free stuff as much as they want to listen to their pitch. They're very complicated. Most people don't have a clue what they're buying or they think they're buying something that isn't there. There's an accumulation and a distribution phase, just like a variable annuity. There's a surrender period, just like a deferred annuity. Uh, you can lose money if you take money out in the surrender period after you discover what it's all about. They're often decepti deceptively sold. Uh, they're sold by saying, you can, go to the, you can go to the casino and play blackjack. And if you want, you can hit on 18 because you can't lose money. And that's basically the way they're, they're sold. It's a way that you can gamble and not lose money. There is less market risk. When they first developed these things, they developed them to compete with CDs. And they do a pretty good job. I mean, they do a, a very good job of competing with a CD, but they're not marketed honestly. So the way it works is your account balance is credited in the beginning. And it's based on an index. Typically, it's a S&P 500, but it can be a gold index. It can be NASDAQ. It could be anything. And they don't include the, the dividends in it. They're just taking a point-to-point -point measurement of how well it's done in the anniversary year that you've had these. But they do guarantee that the floor is never going to go below zero. And there's also some admin fees they take out of it. So there's three things that they use to determine how much you're going to get credited. One is a participation rate. Usually it's 40 to 60%. So if the stock market, let's say it's 45%, that's the example Fenrir uses. If the stock market goes up 10%, you're going to get 4.5% credit to your account. If it goes up 4%, um, then you get 4% credit. Um, they also intermix that with a cap rate. So they'll say, well, this is the maximum you can learn. So if, if the stock market goes up 10% and you have a 5% cap, uh, it'll, you only get credit to your account 5%. And the last thing is a spread. Typically it's a 3% spread. So whatever the stock market does, they're gonna subtract 3%. But what they do is they guarantee it's not gonna go below zero. So you get the picture already just what just from hearing some of those numbers. What it does is it just pushes it toward the middle, toward CD rates, and that's exactly what you end up getting. Here's a study that was done between 2007 and 2012. The average return of all fixed index annuities was 3.27%. I mean, we're talking, we're talking CD returns. The best of all of them was 5.5, and the worst of all of them was 1.2. So you can see exactly what's happening. They're sold as a, as a stock market investment, but they're really a CD product. Uh, if you just took, I just took a 50-50 Vanguard total stock market, total bond market over the last 10 years, it's paid out 8.71%. So you can see that you probably do better if you just invest it in the stock market. So that's, that's what they're all about. So that's basically it. Um, I am open for questions. There's no good place to learn. These are three books that probably I, I'd, I'd start you with, but the best place to go is to go on the SEC site. They give lots of explanations of, uh, of annuities there, lots of uh, investor warnings. Uh, FINRA is the second place I'd send you. They give lots of information. Uh, you can type in annuity fraud and you'll get an education there about what the, what they're doing to the customers that are out there. And then maybe these three books is a place. The middle one is, a, the, the left one endorses a lot of the selling of the annuities. The middle one is uh, Wade Fowles, latest one. I have it, I'm about 25% through it. A lot of theory that goes into that. And the, and the one on the right, he's a pretty straight shooter, but he's an annuity salesman. And you'll see his articles uh, 
online. If you type in annuities, eventually his, his stuff will come up. Stan the annuity man, he calls himself. So that's it. That's the end of the presentation. And uh, I hope you get something out of it. And uh, I hope you can help somebody else. That's the main focus that I have today. You can, you can help some other investor somewhere. Thank you.